Michael Kiriakou is the chair of the UCU branch at the University of East Anglia, UEA, and we're going to be discussing uh, what's a, what is a major financial crisis that's currently hit the university, a crisis which um, seems to have led to the resignation of the vice chancellor um, and has potential major ramifications for workers at the university. And it's that that we're going to be focusing on the impact on staff and workers. Uh, before we get into any of that, uh, I just want to say a massive thank you, Michael, for joining us. And how are you doing? Doing pretty well, Chris. How are you? I should have I should have removed my cans from my window. You can see how I live now. Um, uh, but I'm doing all right. Thank you. How are you? Yeah, doing very well. And uh, no need to remove the cans. Don't worry. <laughs> um, so let's get into it then. So obviously, uh, lots of viewers will be well aware of the high profile national dispute that UCU mm. is involved in around pay, pension and so on. Um, but you've got a particular set of concerns for workers at UEA at the moment. Could you talk us through the situation at UEA? Um, uh, so the employer made us aware back in January um, uh, that their budget wasn't where they expected it to be. Um, uh, and this was to the tune of around £23 million deficit rising to £30 million. Um, uh, it turns out actually it's worse than that. Um, uh, we're looking at a £30 million black hole in the finances leading to £45 million. Um, uh, and, and they sent an, an email out um, uh, to all staff, um, uh, which they messed up the comms cascading on, which led to it getting reported in the press before people basically saying that they didn't think they would be able to make all of the savings by cutting none pay budgets so and I'll, I'll quote directly from the email because i don't want to be accused of saying something that isn't true in effect um so the university said as you know we've worked very hard to safeguard roles by continually reducing non-paid budgets this is no longer sustainable i'm sorry to say it's unlikely we'll be make we can make all the savings without compulsory redundancies clearly this will be a last resort after all other options have been considered and we will work very closely with our campus trade unions on this so what we're looking at in effect is a massive hole in the finances to the tune of 30 million pounds of savings this year and an additional 15 million pounds of savings next year if we don't write course that could lead to what was said to me by a senior university figure as substantial and unpalatable redundancies and that's a really worrying position for both academics and non-academic staff at the university so there's there's a real big gap in the finances the university is i'll say working with us to look at routes to close it their position is there are no redundancies that they haven't, they don't have the information together um, uh, to know exactly what roles would be at risk. So redundancies aren't happening, despite I think it being clear to everyone involved in the process, a highly likely position. As the trade union locally, we've been working with the employer um, uh, to kind of understand what's going on. That's been quite difficult. We've got some information from them that has been useful but I would say nowhere near enough to realistically appraise and understand the detail of the situation. Our goal is always to avoid dispute because obviously that would mean staff losing days pay, but I think it's getting increasingly unlikely given the way in which senior management is handling myself in the union that we'll be able to avoid that. I mean, it, it borders on the unbelievable to be honest, getting told that there are no plans for redundancy when I'm having school meetings in which we're discussing precisely the cuts that are being proposed on a budgetary level. This will affect every single department and service the university offers. Um, I think we're looking at approximately 30% of the humanities budget going. Um, that was confirmed by the vice chancellor in a meeting, which could be really significant. So there are some mitigations that have been put in place. The university has run a voluntary severance scheme. Um, uh, so some members will be opting to look elsewhere or if they're closer to retirement, get a bit of a payout and go. But that won't make £30 million worth of savings, let alone the 45 needed. So basically, massive back hole in the finances. People extremely worried about their jobs. Most people I talk to are either looking for work elsewhere or are just really, really concerned about the pools that are going to come. So, I mean, that's a very bleak picture. <laughs> I guess, what's your understanding of how we got here where the university's got this potentially 45 million pound black hole in its finances? So I think there's a whole host of different factors that are impacting not just UEA, but the sector as a whole. So one of those things is rising energy prices. I think the university's bills have gone up to around 5 million a year. Um, uh, that's not great. 
um, uh, looking at the broader student recruitment pictures, and this is where, where the crisis has come from. So in effect, the university had predicted almost like an endless positive growth of students. So they said, well, we'll continue to get more and more and more students. And they did so off the back of a data HE set of information in effect. So saying, we're going to continue to grow. We're going to continue to get loads of students in. And they budgeted off the back of that. Now, we had a pandemic in there, which was an odd bit for the data set. But we can put the pandemic to one side um, uh, for a second. If you want to come back to it, we can come back to it. But basically, the university over predicted student numbers and budgeted based on students that never turned up. And this isn't the first year of this, this is the third or the fourth year of basically failing to meet recruitment targets, recruitment targets which were set, to my mind, unreasonably high. And that has resulted in the deficit, right? So it's a little bit of a paper deficit in the sense that it's the university's reappraisal of its budgets that has created the increase in deficit. So it's precisely within the gift and auspice of senior management to set those targets. They've set those targets extremely ambitiously and continue to set ambitious targets. Some people will say university managers should do that. Other people will say they should have been more prudential. There's a little bit of a discussion around how these targets are set, who sets them. University management will say schools set them. If you talk to any admissions director within the university, they'll know that they're told what targets to meet. And behind all of this, we think about academic income. So UEA's academic income, well, I say academic, UEA's net income has risen about 7.5% over the last couple of years. Expenditure on academic staff has gone up 18.6%. Expenditure on administration and non-academic staff is probably in the mid-20s. And executive team pay has gone up around 30% in the same time frame. So you can see money's going out, income hasn't risen. And at the same time, shackles have been placed under the guise of CMA in some part, Competition Markets Authority legislation, but really the university's interpretation of that to kind of restrict the capacity of academic and support staff to be innovative, to grow new courses. I mean, if you wanted to propose a new module, there was a two year wait time um, uh, to just get one new module on the books, as I'm sure you're aware, Chris. So it's been really difficult for staff to grow into new areas, to expand income. And to be honest, there's a real reticence to think about growth, to think about what kind of courses people want to study and to make use of the expertise that UEA currently has amongst the staff base. So the real reason behind all of this, we can put aside paying pensions costs, university management loves to talk up, you know, staff are expensive, but you do have to pay them and you should be wanting to pay them well. Um, uh, so we can put aside that, we can put aside um, uh, energy costs, that's hitting everyone. The main thing is this decision around student numbers, the decision to reevaluate and the fact that the executive has been over predicting students without delivering the number of students on that predictive model so that's increased expenditure which has resulted in this now untenable black hole but it's worth saying the university has run a deficit for many years um, and they were happy with the deficit and confident with the deficit and the scale of it and that we would recover i mean post covid i was in negotiation with them to get through the crisis to avoid redundancy and at the end of it they, we agreed um, uh, with our membership in the university to forgo increments on grade eight and above. Um, and the university said, we're in such robust financial health, you can have that back. Um, uh, and then <laughs> come January, apparently we're not in robust financial health. So it's gone from recovery to crisis in a split second, really. And so what do you think the impact of this is going to be on, I guess, well, first, first and foremost, staff, but then also on the, the kind of the wider academic outputs of, of the university. So you mentioned earlier, like you're looking at potentially 30% of uh, humanities going. Like what's what's the impact of this going to be if um, if the the way that, that black hole is closed is through cuts? Yeah, it's it's really it's really difficult for me to say because the university, by their own admission, doesn't have a business case or plan for this yet. So they they've announced all of this in January to staff. It's been now four months. Um, uh, coming up, well, it will be four months coming up to April when they're supposed to have a case that they can share with us, a proposal, so we can actually understand how things look like. My understanding is they have no idea of what that would look like at all. And this is this is what they're telling me in our joint consultative committee. So I'm in the position now where I'm like, I can't really say what the impact will be. So I have to talk about what the impact is, I fear, basically. So what, what might be the case? And I'll talk through, if, if it's useful, different kind of scenarios. So one scenario is they say, OK, actually, we're unwilling to look at any budget 
to reduction or any strategic priority. We want to save 30 million by September and then a further 15 million the year after to make sure everything's lined up and we're going to hit staff to do that. And that would effectively result in mass cuts um, uh, in harm and SSF. Now, I don't know this is the case. Let's imagine we get a, a good saving from VS, which is itself a tragedy because that means staff are leaving. Um, uh, we'd still see significant um, uh, potential job loss um, uh, through either voluntary or compulsory redundancy in harm and SSF. So harm is the humanities. Um, UEA has got a bit of a weird academic structure, so that would include politics and other kind of departments you might not necessarily think were in the humanities. And SSF is the social sciences faculty, which includes the business school, psychology, law, um, uh, social work, in effect. So those faculties, to my understanding, are ones where larger proportionate cuts are being proposed. Um, uh, there would still be cuts in the science faculty and in the medicine faculty as well, so what we call SCI and FMH, as well as divisional savings. If we would see 30% of HOMS budget go, a lot of this would depend on the individual staff that are put into redundancy pools, but that would be a significant reduction in output. I mean, the way in which I think about it is like an amputation. Um, uh, and if you're going to do an amputation, you need to have all of the tourniquets in place to make sure the patient doesn't die of blood loss. Um, uh, I've said many times in the media, I fear a death spiral. And I think if we made that amount of saving 10% of the total university's turnover in one go um, uh, by September, which would be basically like six, seven months, uh, that, that, would, that would be inordinate. And I, don't, I can't see a path to recovery there because we know from bitter experience where you run redundancy pools like that, the staff that remain have a form of survivor's guilt. I think it's likely that the deficit's going to grow if we have a bad clearing. Um, I think it gets increasingly likely that we're going to have a bad clearing if you've got staff who are in redundancy pools carrying out that clearing. And I, I'm really concerned that um, if, if the university opts for that model, then we would be in real trouble as an institution. But that's the worst case scenario, right? And I said I've talked about multiple ones. There, there, there's a kind of a middle way. Um, and I don't want to present it as an Aristotelian golden mean kind of thing, because it isn't that at all, really. Um, uh, that's where they kind of work with us a little bit, but not but not really. And they say, we'll move some stuff around here or there, but it's going to be majority staff costs that are going to make up this budgetary saving. And then we would see through moving some money out of other budgets, maybe pushing back a strategic priority or two, savings to be made, and then reorienting the structure over the longer term. And that, that I think would be a better case scenario um, in which we'd see less job loss or less potential job loss. And that might be that might be mitigatable. And obviously the best case scenario is the position which the branch has taken, um, which is a zero redundancies position. And any trade union worth its salt is gonna argue for a zero redundancies position. There's strategic, there's tactical, and there's grand strategic objectives behind taking that position. It's one I really hope we can achieve either through agreement. And the university said to me, of course, Michael, there aren't going to be the wide scale redundancies. We don't know anything. We don't know anything. My line, of course, in response is, well, you could agree a zero redundancies position then. And then, of course, they say no, because really redundancies are coming. Um, and we both know that. So I would hope we could achieve that. I think trying to get this done by September and any organization as big as UEA trying to save effectively 10, 15, 13% of its budget, depending on when you take the figures, should do so over a long-term plan. And my hope is that we can understand, yes, we have to watch out for our banking covenants. If we breach those, the interest rates on the loans that the university's taken out for all of its fancy buildings go up, and then we've got to supplant that interest cost, um, which would mean further job loss. And that's where part of this death spiral stuff comes from. Because if, you've, if you breach those covenants, it's game over. Universities have income, predominantly that's student tuition. The university likes to make a lot of um, uh, the tuition fee cap. And this is where kind of the government looms in picture as something which is failing to support higher education as in universities effectively. We can have a chat about that if it's useful. But I think partly this the kind of the best case scenario is the university looks at those strategic budgets, takes its VS saving and reorientates it. It pivots and it says, okay, actually let's try and make this over as long a time scale as we can. Let's say we're not going to do some of the fancy, strategic, flashy bits and pieces we want to do. And let's focus on providing for our core business that of educating students. And we can look at cost reduction, but we also need to put forward an effective recovery plan and put forward a plan for growth. And those latter two things are, are completely missing from any of the conversations I've had. And I think according to our numbers, they're down. They're down badly. 
and when they're down badly comparatively, but there's space for growth there. And I think the university needs to take seriously why aren't students coming to UEA? And they can't just blame Norwich like they have done historically and say, no one knows where Norwich is. No one's going to come to Norwich for university. I, I think that talks ourselves down, talks down the local community. So in terms of impact, if we look at significant job loss, that's really problematic for the region locally. Complete failure to offer what I think UEA's purpose vision is, which is to provide is a provincial university, is a university for working people. It's one of those 60s universities that came up with the idea of giving working people access to higher education. And that means access to a wide range of subjects. And my concern is that when staff leave, it takes years and years and years to rebuild academic expertise and understanding in a course offering. And my concern is that if we end up with large amounts of staff leaving the institution, whether through attrition, whether through voluntary severance, voluntary redundancy or compulsory redundancy, then we end up in a situation in which the offering for the local community, the national, international community is significantly reduced, that because of the loss of staff, operationally, the university won't be able to continue within a safe workload. And there's a debate about whether or not we're safe on workload at the moment. That's why we have the national dispute. But whether we're able to offer what people want, but not only what people want, a robust offering to students of all walks. And that would mean changing core offer offerings around so that staff left could deliver. And there's been a whole host of different models touted about what that might look like. We really don't know because we're not on the other side of this yet. But my worry is that those darker managerial interests towards large classes of students with one staff member responsible for delivery to lecture theatres of 200, 300 is a way they can go because they view it as an efficient model of teaching. And we could see changes to core structure that would strip out what I would call choice. The university has its own definitions of student choice. That would mean pathways become more determined for students and therefore what students are learning becomes different because operationally that makes sense. Pedagogically, I think there's huge problems there. But sorry, I've kind of rambled on a little bit for you. Not at all. That's incredibly helpful. I guess since when I first wrote to you to invite you on the show, I guess like the, a major thing has happened in the last uh, couple of weeks, which is that the Vice Chancellor, Dave Richardson, has resigned. Uh, what's your assessment of what this means for, I guess, your negotiations in the union branch, but also how the university will handle this black hole? Yeah, I think um, uh, David Richardson's resignation is um, uh, in, in some ways, I think, commendable. I think respect to anyone that takes accountability, that recognises um, uh, it's their circus and their monkeys and kind of says, yeah, um, uh, this is on me. Um, uh, I'll branch no confidence the vice chancellor, the now acting vice chancellor and the chief resource officer of the institution. We determine those three to be what we would call politically accountable. Um, uh, they're, they're members of staff that um, uh, are accountable for the running of the university. And we, we said this, this is unacceptable. Um, so we don't have confidence in the current acting vice chancellor and we don't and continue to not have confidence in the chief resource officer of the institution. It's a, it's a heavy decision to take to do that. And I don't know whether that had any bearing at all on the vice chancellor's resignation. Um, I think as we both know, David Richardson really cared about UEA. Um, he's someone who, who's given large, large, vast majority of his career to the institution so there's a part of me which is very sad to see him go I think he's someone that would have really tried hard what does it mean for the future well that will be looking to what's called the interim vice chancellor whoever they hire in um, uh, and I really hope it's someone that will understand working with us is important someone that's going to bring fresh eyes to the crisis and someone that will be willing to push towards that better solution rather than getting in a hatchet person that's just going to swing the axe and be like, I'm here to do your cuts for 18 to 12 months. I'm willing to take the flack because I'm not someone who's growing onto the institution, someone that's fond of it. So I think there's two paths in front of us. One is if they get in someone from the darker areas of the sector, someone who's going to come in and say, like any business, universities or businesses, we need to chop. Um, uh, and then once we've chopped, suddenly the, the tree will grow if we just cut all the roots off. It doesn't seem like a way I would think about it. Or whether we get someone in that's willing to be like, OK, how are we going to grow? How are we going to feed this? How can we push this out? I think there's a real opportunity in the interim vice chancellor to get someone in who isn't bound by the kind of the old received logics of management at UEA. So I mean, because it's not their circus and monkeys, they'll be coming into it. And hopefully we can get someone that 
understands actually protecting staff livelihood is worth more than um, uh, loyalty to a, a troika of managerial decision making focused around finding pay budgets as the most important thing to cut. That is a large proportion of our expenditure, but you would hope that any university would be spending a lot of money on staff because that means you're getting good staff and you're giving them a good position. And what I would hate to see is an interim vice chancellor that came in and was just unwilling to work with us. And by us, I mean the trade unions there, but also more broadly staff generally. And someone that came in and said, I'm here to make these cuts and viewed all of this as a fait accompli because I think that would be disastrous for not only staff, but for Norwich as a city, for Norfolk as a region. And so I want to, whilst I've got you, I want to ask you something about the national disputes. But before mm -hmm. I come on to that, um, to wrap up this conversation, mm -hmm. Uh, how can our viewers uh, support the UEA UCU branch and the other trade unions on campus? I, th I think I think getting in touch with us. So, so, so your viewers know we have three um, uh, trade unions that are recognised on campus. We've got UCU, which represents academic staff, and ALC staff, so people basically above grade six. And then we've got Unison, which represents kind of the rest of the pay spine, predominantly catering, cleaning. And then we have Unite, which represents um, uh, technical staff. And my apologies to Unison and Unite if I've got your remit slightly mixed up there. Obviously, I'm using you focus. And all three of us work very closely together. We meet regularly. We all have interests of each other's members at heart because we're about the people that perform UEA, the people that make UEA a university. Um, uh, so how could your viewers help? I think getting in touch, solidarity messages are always appreciated. I think getting in touch with management and letting them know this is disastrous, um, uh, that this is going to have an impact and that they need to work with us to find um, uh, a better path than just devastating loss of livelihood. And I do think that is the correct terms to put this in because 10% of the university's total budget is a lot of money. We're above 10% now. We're looking at 13, 15%. That's a lot of livelihoods. Um, uh, and I'm concerned the university is going to try and make savings that are going to disproportionately impact people lower on the spine, disproportionately impact people on precarious contract. Um, so I think getting in touch with the chair of council, getting in touch with the acting vice chancellor, the chief resource officer, and letting them know the, this impact is untenable. And of course, get in touch with the local branch. Um, uh, and we're always happy to have that conversation with people. And finally then, so... To zoom out a bit to the wider context in which this, this is happening in, uh, you're obviously in a national dispute at the moment, um, both around uh, the USS pension scheme and also the four fights around pay, casualisation and so on. Uh, there's been, I guess, a bunch of news that's taken place within the union over the last couple of days. Um, what's your assessment of the state of play in terms of negotiations and the dispute? I think it's a, it's a really complex question to unpick it. Um, and I don't think UCU nationally knows what the state of play is with regard to national negotiations at the moment. Because like you say, we're right on the cusp of this. Um, uh, so negotiations have concluded, is my understanding, with both UCA and USS. Um, uh, they've come to what they've considered their final offer and they've moved to implement um, uh, the pay award. Um, this is the same pay award which was rejected by the membership at large. Um, uh, UEA has exempted itself from that pay award. So within New Ginches, there's an 11 month basic agreement where you say, I can't afford this. If you force me to expend more on staff, I would have compulsory redundancies. This isn't something the university or the employer has to consult with us on. Um, uh, they did seek our opinion. We had a back and forth with them, which was constructive to an element. We said, we need to put this to our members. They said, we are going to do it as, as is our legal right. Um, uh, so no staff member at UEA will benefit from the pay award. Um, uh, for 11 months. Basically, UEA has bought itself 11 months as it can do on New Gingers to get its affairs in order, and then it will have to implement the pay award. So where are we at in national negotiations? Well, my understanding is the offer was put to HEC. So HEC is our elected decision-making body. Um, uh, at the same time, there was a poll run of kind of the wider membership saying, do you, do you want to pause action and consult on this ballot and the question was put together and it appears to my knowledge that the poll said yes we want to pause action and we want to consult on the ballot locally we took a poll of our membership and my understanding is that skewed towards yes for pausing and consulting but we kept the question together at the HEC meeting my understanding is they took the question of pausing and um, uh, 
well, uh, sorry, the branch delegate meeting, because there's so many of these meetings. So we send delegates who inform the branch position. My understanding is they took it in parts, basically. So I said, okay, on the whole, we don't want to pause action, but we would like to put it to members. HEC have taken the decision um, uh, for various reasons tomorrow, and I'm not on HEC, so I don't know all of the litany of political, non-political reasons why they might make this decision, not to put it to members and not to pause the action. So they've said, we're going to continue with the dispute. Um, uh, so that means that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday's action is on. Um, uh, we'll run picket lines at the university. We'll continue to talk with our membership. And the offer we've received is quite a complex one. So obviously there's two separate disputes here. There's the full fights dispute. Um, uh, pay, there's been no movement. I think to present that as anything else is untrue. There's been no movement on the previous offer we rejected. But there has been movement on the other three fights. And basically they've agreed to time-limited negotiation to establish national framework which is actually a win in of itself because you see, I said they would never do that. So I think it's useful that some progress has been made there. Whether or not that's enough for members to accept, we won't know because it's not going to the membership. On USS, we've basically got what we wanted in terms of benefit restitution. Um, uh, but also we've got a commitment to look at how the fund, the valuation of the pension scheme would be. So looking really closely with the employer about the methodology used to conduct evaluation, which is a big win in of itself, because the valuation has been the sticking point for a lot of this dispute on pensions. Now, my understanding is HEC might want to disaggregate them. We have policy which ties the two disputes together. And if significant progress is made in one, HEC can choose to disaggregate them, to break them back apart and say, well, we want to maybe put the pension offer to members, but not pay. That's difficult because the pension scheme we're debating and kind of negotiating on only affects a proportion of universities, those that existed before 1992. Um, uh, so there's a lot of politics in this. There's a lot of industrial strategy in this. Where we go forwards, I have to take my steer from my membership because we're members led and find out what the members want to do. Part of this is we have an active revalue. So we're looking to extend our mandate out, which would have run out in April because of the anti-trade union laws. We should win that wee ballot. We're encouraging everyone to vote in it. And it's my hope, and I would, I'd like to say my understanding that we're gonna do well in that wee ballot. And that would give us a really clear message to employers you need to push. Now, my understanding on the other side of this is we have a university that can't afford the pay award. Um, uh, that's it's several millions. Um, and I wouldn't pretend it's not several millions. It would be jobs at UVA. If, we pushed beyond 5% of a pay award, then we might, there might be say, let's imagine like 30 universities that could be pushed to a similar position to UEA where they consider compulsory redundancies of some form. So that's a, that's a backdrop to the national kind of organizing. We also have national bargaining. My understanding is as they, as they always do, a lot of employers are making noises about national collective bargaining, whether they want that, how that's gonna operate. So we're in that position where that we, need, we need more on pay. We need more for the sake of staff's livelihood. We need more for the sake of staff up and down the spine on pay. We need to find a way we can get that that doesn't lead to redundancies. But also we've got this progress on pensions that we want, that we need, that we fought hard for for five, 10, 15 years, depending on where you cut that pie. And otherwise we've got these kind of non-pay elements that we need to have a discussion on. So where we're going is really in the hands of HEC here. We've got a SHESC coming up, which is a special higher education sector conference, where this will be debated through branch delegates. My understanding is there's going to be a whole host of different motions going to that meeting. And my hope is that SHESC will be used to kind of shape this out. Broadly, there is a bit of a gap that's been produced now by the decision to run the poll, by the decision from the branch delegate meeting and HEC are at odds here. HEC are saying, we don't want to put this to members, it's an offensive offer, we must continue with the action. And a large proportion of our membership wants to hear that offer, wants to have the chance to vote on it. Now, I'm not on HEC, I would have put it to the membership, maybe with a reject um, uh, kind of outline thing, but we'll have to see how that goes. My understanding is UCA and UUK want a end to industrial action because employers always want an end to industrial action very rarely will they offer you a square deal though um, but they want that end to industrial action so i think they're going to try and aggregate the two together 
Um, uh, and I think the union has a very clear position of aggregation unless significant progress is made. So there's a technical decision there as well. Where we're at locally is for members to decide. We're hoping to run a branch meeting sooner rather than later so we can get member input, so we can form our position with regard to Shesk and we can make a claim which UBA members are happy with with regard to the future of the action. I know that's probably a bit of a washy of answer um, uh, than you hope for, Chris, but um, uh, I hope it's useful nonetheless. That's incredibly useful. I think for a lot of people, you know, they've seen their Twitter feeds filled with uh, certain sides within UCU who've taken particularly strong views. And so I think you've put that uh, very helpfully in setting out what's really going on there. Um, but I'll let you get on with the rest of your Sunday. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure.